Prisoner 421J, you have been found guilty of five counts of first-degree arson across Limgrave, endangering the lives of hundreds of innocent citizens, and in an act of aggressive destruction of property, attempted to ride the cargo car while chanting, I am the Lich God, I wipe my ass on the robes of your kings and floss my teeth with the swords of your soldiers. The court sentences you to be hanged for your crimes. Have you any final sayings before your death? Wait, wait. Ma'am, have you looked at this guy? He's like, mentally gone. I don't think he can understand what we're even saying. He probably doesn't even know where he is. <laughs> I fail to understand how this is of any concern to the court of Lanedale or the safety of its people. We are to keep the peace and nothing more. Mental anguish is of the poorest excuses for such crimes. I'm not arguing with that, but look at these records. This guy had a weird life. According to his employment, he spent 26 years as a, uh, something called an influencer. What sort of preposterous profession is that supposed to be? I guess it's what they called entertainers in his world, kind of like a jester. He spent every waking moment of his life making a specific type of video called a, uh, a tier list? <laughs> Do not cite that odiferous work to me again, you piss-drenched python. You'll summon the review bots. Then no one will leave here. Uh, what do we do here, ma'am? Release him. Exile him from this nation. His existence in this mental state is but punishment enough. Today we're uh, ranking the legendary armaments. There, there, there's, no, there's nine of them. Is, is, that, is that cool? Is that cool with you? How about you follow my Discord server? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good idea. Yeah, you don't already have 247 servers on mute anyways. But why not make it 248? Go, go ahead, just see what happens. Do it. So, obviously, we're starting with the bottom of the barrel. It, shit, this isn't even the barrel. The showtel dug through the barrel, down into the ground, and struck enough oil to pay off all the college debt in America. Deathblade will never be viable. It just won't. Everyone has already compiled their own list of ways you can two-shot people in PvP. If you make your whole game about cheesing the shit out of everything, you're just gonna make PvP balance a nightmare for yourself. But at least they cared enough to fix it with the Colosseum update. The Eclipse showtel is not completely worthless, but calling it a legendary tier item means it's getting compared to the Legends. The use of Deathblight is already limited to the severely narrow hallway that is the multiplayer experience, and if you have enough damage and holy boosting talismans, you'll just kill whoever you're fighting on damage alone before anything even procs. It has a significantly shorter range than other curved swords, it can't be altered with affinities, and it needs an ass ton of work and investment to make a build that competes with other equally strong and mostly stronger weapons. I'd sooner use this thing to pick my teeth than use it anywhere in or outside of offline play. The sight of an Eclipse inspires a dreadful awe, and I've never felt more dreadful in my whole goddamn life than trying to search for any utility on this over-decorated backscratcher. So if anything, this item description on this weapon actually manages to be somewhat correct. Congratulations, Eclipse Shotel. You're the worst legendary weapon of the entire lineup. I hope you wake up tomorrow with whale aid. <laughs> Why did I write that? The Devourer's Scepter represents a vision of the future seen by Riker during his final moments before he became snake shit. How about you devour these nuts, Burnall? It's one of the longest great hammers you can find in the whole game. D I have officially run out of positive things to say about the Devourer's Scepter. Oh, and it's great for small mobs that wouldn't pose any threat in any situation to begin with. Now I've run out of positive things to say. Suggested by four out of five professional magma sorcerers straight from the bowels of the Great Serpent. I guess the other guy actually knows how to play the fucking game. Everything this can do the cranial vessel candle stand can do significantly better, and without having to split your stats down three different avenues. And if we're being outclassed by Victorian furniture, then we're in real bad shape. If you've already invested in these stats, that puts you on a one-way road to the blasphemous blade anyway, so you might as well pick up a weapon worth a shit. Sure, AoE lifesteal is neat, that's all good and fine. You know what else is fine? The Gravitas skill, with Taker's cameo. There you go. In all honesty, this skill does give you 15% of your max HP per enemy hit, so it's great to have have in your back pocket if you're out of healing and want to top off, I guess. I'm not willing to be too mean to this weapon, but I am willing to be just mean enough. Maybe it pulls a little more weight in New Game Plus iterations, but plenty of non-legendary weapons are already doing that legwork anyways. 
And why the shitting hell does this thing need 20 decks? Until anyone gives me reason not to believe this, I'm just gonna continue thinking this was the only creative contribution George R.R. Martin made to the game. This sword is, uh... It's okay, I guess. It has decent base damage, but with good strength stats, it becomes a fucking monster if you get it fully leveled. The unique skill is Endure with like a tiny stat boost. The skill received a buff not too long ago that extends the stat buff duration to 60 seconds, so if it's early game, you now have enough time to put on the buff and then quickly expunge that shit from your inventory in exchange for a better weapon. Come to think of it, that's probably what you should be doing with this anyways. Spell and Catalyst requirements become slightly easier to meet, it stacks with a Godric's Rune, and you're slightly less likely to cause an Earth Earthquake with your dump truck pair of ass cheeks. It's a little helpful in all spaces, and those spaces rapidly close up the further into the game you go. It does have relatively small stat requirements though, which makes sense considering you scrape it off the Elden Ring equivalent of a homeless person. It's honestly a wonderful weapon that'll carry you all the way to Kaelid if you upgrade it properly, but the minute it falls off, it's a 90 degree angle free fall straight down without a parachute, and it's time for you to start searching for a trash can. Also. I'm sorry. No, I'm not. This thing is fuck ugly. This is what it would look like if Ikea started selling swords. I'm not even kidding around. Look at it. It looks like a Christmas tree right after you take it out of the box. What is this thing? Is this a club? The Murray Executioner Sword was- no, 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 no. Okay, hang on, hang on, just chill out. Look, I'm sad about this too, okay? But we need to talk about this weapon. What is it lately with this weird syndrome going around where people see a one-shot build on YouTube and immediately just decide that it's the only build worth considering? Have you ever actually tried to land this thing on a target that isn't stance broken? It's like trying to squeeze a piss through the center hole of a DVD. Shit's hard as fuck. This sword is a harsh but helpful reminder that the standard combat flow is always gonna be king above all else. If the performance there is lacking, it's off to the trash bin. You definitely can one-shot plenty of bosses with this sword if you feel like pulling out the checklist and hunting down all the items required for that build, or you can just grab a weapon with a high base AR and stat scaling and watch your charged heavy sail through 500 pounds of armor like fucking yogurt. And I doubt we're gonna get that from a sword that tops off with B scaling. The skill is powerful, indeed. Definitely more powerful than it has any business being, but is this what legendary armaments have to offer? Just a semi-capable range of consistent damage with one showstopper move that just whiffs if whatever you're aiming at doesn't stand still for the whole windup? It's, it's another magic greatsword. That's all I have to say about it. A sword made almost entirely of light, but it still weighs 10 pounds. Nothing heavier than that logic. I hate to sound like I'm making some huge deal out of this when it I'm, I'm sure it actually matters to like zero people, but wasn't Elden Ring's whole philosophy based on making gameplay more accurate to the lore? Isn't that why Melania and Mog are as nut-kickingly powerful as they are in the game? So if that's the case, then isn't holy damage also supposed to be the most powerful lore-wise? Why does it only have like three applications in game? Why do you guys keep doing this. This is a wonderfully designed weapon, mind you. It's not even that this weapon is bad, it's that this greatsword should be topping the list with how legendary it is. But unfortunately, everything about how this sword works just feels serviceable, decent, not bad. And not bad is not a criteria that a legendary armament should be struggling to meet. I feel like I would have a better time just slapping a sacred affinity on a greatsword and playing pretend. Go ahead and try to explain why I found this thing where I did. Go, go on, go on ahead. How did some dude cosplaying as a lion hiding out in a frozen cave somewhere in Mount Son of a Bitch end up scratching his ass with one of the most storied swords in all of existence. The inseparable sword seems to pull all the necessary weight and then some despite its weapon skill being smaller and overall less damaging. And that's one thing I feel I should give some due credit for is the unique skill on this weapon. It's good. It's very good. It's not great, it's very good. The initial shockwave acts as a miniature, slightly more underwhelming Wrath of Gold or Rejection type spell, while the follow-up is just a giant holy slice anime attack that does just as much damage as it looks like it does. The knockback utility is a nice addition, but running into the massive endgame wall where everyone starts learning how to deal with holy damage just makes this sword less desirable on pretty much any account. Unless you're going after the Death Bird and Consecrated Snowfield, in which case I guess it can stick around the little longer. Well, hope the divorce was worth it, guys. Okay, so we're finally heading out into the territory where the weapons are actually getting, dare I say, legendary. Up until this point, the weapons I've talked about weren't bad. Some of them I actually really enjoyed, but I always felt like I had better options at my disposal. This is where that stops. 
The Bolt of Grand Saxe was once so powerful that it was renowned throughout the entire nation as the only thing to have ever pierced the walls of Landell. It was so powerful that it single-handedly catalyzed the war against dragons. Lore-wise, it's easily the most powerful weapon you could possibly ask for, but a lot of decisions here don't make sense to me. Okay, listen, I'm growing just as tired of bitching about weird lightning scaling as much as you guys are listening to it, so uh, grab your pillows, because today you're attending a lecture on why double dipping just ends up being a pain in the ass for everyone. Additionally, to my knowledge, it's one of the only legendary armaments you can entirely just miss out on if you're not careful. Killing Malekith means that giant bolt is no longer there, and therefore the weapon itself as well. A huge selling point of the spear is that it actually shares the bonus given to you by the dragon scale weapons, and that it does extra damage to dragons, which almost feels like an elaborate practical joke seeing as how most of the endgame dragons have lightning resistance out the ass. I like having access to a sniper rifle where most enemies in the game suffer from awful nearsightedness where they lose focus of anything standing 10 feet in front of them, but when that doesn't go well, you're just immediately out of options. Because let's face it, zero people are out there using this spear because they like spears. The only reason you want this is because you like smiting fuckers from miles away like the vengeful Old Testament god you are. And without that skill, this spear might as well be bedroom furniture. Whoa! Sword of Night and Flame, what are you doing all the way up here? Shouldn't you be down below with the ruffians scrubbing floors and shit? Having a single weapon that deals physical, magic, and fire damage is a one-sentence horror story for your balancing team, I'm sure. But split-scaling weapons have this weird tendency to bring out some really awkward stat choices in players. Sure, leveling up both intelligence and faith so you can take full advantage of everything the sword gives you sounds foolproof on paper, but by the time you've reached the end game, both your stats are barely tickling 50, with little investment into anything else, and then you wonder why your standard physical attacks are doing shit all. I'm gonna be bluntly honest, this sword takes a lot of setup, probably more than it's worth to a lot of people, but if you have a negative opinion of this weapon, there is a high chance you might just not be building effectively for it. When it comes to intelligence versus faith, just pick a single direction and, and just, just keep going, don't look back. If you commit to the split too hard, you're just gonna rip your ball sack in half. Either direction has a massive upside. Leveling magic means you basically get a studio apartment sized Comet Azer that evaporates anything human sized and doesn't waste a spell slot, and leveling faith means you get a neat crowd control fire fan that does way more damage than it probably should, making it a wonderful tool for both farming and stealth. Building in either direction gives you your own personal fuck you I win button with plenty of benefits outside of oh look damage, probably one of the best options you could ask for in New Game Plus. The Ruins Greatsword is a galactic ass spanking paddle from outer space like no other. You ever feel like sucker punching a dumbass with the whole Andromeda galaxy? This is your weapon. 50 strength sounds like a steep requirement, but the penalties for not meeting the stat requirements are actually more forgiving than most other weapons. Most notably, not meeting the magic requirements means you won't be able to use the weapon skill, but you'll still be able to get all the damage you can out of normal attacks. It's not like you're missing out on stonks of damage anyway, since the base magic damage is a measly 37 and the intelligence scaling caps out at a high D. I've got a high D for the strength scaling on this bitch, that's what I'm after. The little rock explosions on the charged heavies make for a nice bit of extra magic and poise damage while also giving this weapon a bit of personality. The unique skill is simply an embellishment, and although you can squeeze out plenty of damage from it, it's not the crux of the weapon. Keep in mind this bastard demands a heaping 50 strength from you to begin with, so if you can even pick this thing up, then you're already deleting shit with standard R1s anyways. This is a sword that actually earns the legendary moniker, in my opinion. One of the best. The Dark Moon Greatsword is a legendary armament worthy of that title for more than just a couple reasons. It's got insane damage right out of the gate just without any build modification, but that's not really why. The skill is both intuitive and FP efficient, but that's also not why. It's been eight years and I still can't stop thinking about Bloodborne or pining for a remake in a few years because a PC port is out of the fucking question at this point, but that's not even why. Up until now, we've been finding these legendary armaments in the least likely of places. One of them can be found off a bell-bearing hunter, you find one just hanging out in a castle, another plunged in a wall somewhere, three of them wound up in misbegotten territory, not sure why they ended up with the lion's share, but pointing out everything that doesn't add up is just gonna keep me here for the rest of the day. This weapon has an entire side quest that has you- and a bunch of other shit I don't feel like mentioning because I'm too lazy to capture footage for it, but let's just say this weapon requires you to jump through some fucking hoops. The unique skill is wonderfully efficient for FP, like I said. The frost projectiles can be boosted with Godfrey Icon, Shard of Alexander, Magic Shrouding Tear, all that good good, and the extra frostbite application is just a bonus. If it weren't there at all, I don't think my opinion on this sword would even change that much.
I'm, uh, I didn't, didn't write an outro again. You know what? I, I like this trend of like putting a shit ton of effort into all the intros that I make and they're just not having an outro like at all. I think I, I think I'm going to continue doing that. I haven't seen anyone complain about it so far or like feel like it's weird. So I guess I'm just going to keep doing it. Have a uh, fucking in card. Yeah, here you go. Click on, click on that shit. Whatever I decide to put up, whatever it is, click on it.